Actually, the good social worker in me says we should all stand up and stretch or something, but at this point, I think if we settle down, then we'll get to hear our last panel and our last speaker. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. So we know that the people who are here with us now are definitely the people that are palliative care converts. And so we appreciate you being with us um, here for our last segment of the day. We're going to start our last segment of the day off by hearing from Rebecca Kirsch, who's going to discuss the medical and social service integration and patient quality of life and care. Rebecca Kirsch is the American Cancer Society's Director of Quality of Life and Survivorship. She is longstanding and award-winning champion of integrating palliative care for adults and children facing cancer and its aftermath. The rest of her wonderful biography is in our packets, and I encourage you to learn about her good work from looking at that bio sketch. And so now I'd like you to join me in welcoming Rebecca to share her thoughts with us today. Thank you. I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate you hanging in there for the afternoon. It's been a very full day, but a very energizing day, too. And I think everyone is here for the same reason as we know, and this IOM report really made clear that compelling call that we need to do better by our seriously ill adults and children. And that's really because I don't think there's really anything more important to patients and families <laughs> than talking about what's important with them. That's a theme throughout the day. This never happens in the clinic, right? <laughs> um, Person-centered care is so much more than just a buzzword for the patients and families that we're all working to serve. And we know that communication skills are sort of a critical core competency to delivering quality care. But what I would invite us to think a lot about is the recommendations in this report and earlier IOM reports around these communication skills competencies we need to really think of these goals of care discussions just the same way that we do medical procedures. Both require skilled delivery, and that only comes from really good teaching and a whole lot of plentiful practice. Last week, I was here um, hosting a workshop with the National Policy, Cancer Policy Forum around pediatric cancer and integrating quality of life into the fabric of all of it. And uh, I was so grateful to be able to shine a light on children as part of the tsunami that we're seeing because a lot of kids with serious illness are living longer and longer, particularly many forms of childhood cancer, across a lifetime with the aftermath of treatment. And there, too, the same consistent theme about the importance of communication was sort of a resounding message of the day and a half when we brought palliative and psychosocial and medical oncology professionals together, really in many ways for the first time, for them to all be in the same room talking about the problems they all share, but they typically do it in their silos and rub their heads or scratch their heads and think, how are we going to get this different? But if we bring everybody together around shared objectives, we certainly um, get there faster. And I loved that phrase about the uniting forces and the power of that. And last week, we also heard from Evan's parents, Wendy and Gavin, and they talked about the alternative to good communication and the devastation that failures in communication can bring, especially for our most vulnerable children. Evan, at age four, was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. And unfortunately, his prognosis ended up being quite poor. And he was moving into the final stages of his life. And Wendy and Gavin talked with the team and decided, you know, the best place for our son is at home. And they were assured and reassured that bringing him home would not make any difference in the level of Evan's comfort. In fact, it would uh, be supported. But that wasn't what happened. And that was here in our nation's capital. He had home hospice care, but there were no pediatric trained professionals to help, so it was adult hospice workers who came to the house but were afraid to administer to a child the pain medications he would need as his cancer spread and caused more and more distress. And they made a very clearing call to us last week about the same thing that I think this Institute of Medicine Dying and Report did. How can we build a system or reboot the system we now have to better address this inevitability that we're all going to face for ourselves or our loved ones. 
as uh, dying days grow near. The trouble is we don't really know when end of life begins. What we know is that quality of life, life needs start from the get-go, as soon as serious illness knocks at your door. There's been a slew, I'm one of those policy wonks, uh, like Judy talks about for herself, who've read all of these reports a couple of times. I've earmarked pages, I've highlighted stuff, and you know, it's fascinating how consistent the recommendations and the themes are across all of these different pieces, um, whether they're cancer specific or not. I had a heavy hand in creating that uh, IOM pain report that Dr. Pizzo chaired because I was one of the lawyers behind drafting the legislation that made it happen. And it, it's just this steady drumbeat again and again of the quality of life needs that patients and families have. And all of these parts, palliative, psychosocial, need to be part of what we think about it and embed it in the fabric. I think that's why we're all here. That's why we've all stuck it out through the day. And I'm thrilled with the energy in the room because we are the ones who can help really make it happen. But here's the kicker. The messaging that we're using really doesn't align. The narrative doesn't match where patients and even clinicians are wired, which is to think about the quality of living. And I was so glad Dr. Gwandi brought up the story of Susan Block's dad and the conversation she had around chocolate ice cream and American football on TV. That was an aha moment for me a couple of years ago, um, wearing my policy hat and thinking about public policy solutions to get to this problem of bringing palliative care everywhere. Because in that letting go story that's now the anchor of being mortal as well, it was all about exactly where people are. They largely want to be focused on how they want to be living, the quality of their living, not the quality of their dying, the quality of their living until whenever it is that they're dead. So my concern when we're forcing this dialogue and discourse that's so end of life focused is that we may actually impede or delay that delivery of quality of life care that people want from the get-go. So what I like to think about um, when I'm talking to audiences about the messaging that really matters here and how we can get at better end-of-life care through better quality of life care upstream, is we need to kind of pull out of that end-of-life rut and think about moving more in a quality of life groove because that chocolate ice cream and American football on TV story really translates into exactly the kind of care that people want up until whenever it is that they're dead. It's about living life to the fullest each day until they slip away. So the picture in my head that I built um, is really kind of taking an Amazon.com approach to healthcare. If you're interested in disease-directed treatment, you may also be interested in these important parts of quality of life care that are essential. <laughs> This is really good science, but it's not rocket science. This is absolutely achievable now. We talk about aspirational goals, but this is achievable because we do know how to do it. We just have to reorient the system and help equip our patients and families with the words to use to get that care that they want. All these pieces are part of it. We've all been this blessed little bird. <laughs> it was actually born in uh, the window box of my son's tree house. I don't know how it survived. But that little lonely voice, feeling very vulnerable alone, that's something we all feel unless we get together and self-select in a room to say, you know what, if we join forces, we can do better. This is how patients and families feel too, when they go home from the clinic and none of the needs, none of the things that really matter most to them are discussed. So there's a huge opportunity now and this communication theme that we've heard about today is one that I think is particularly exciting because again, we know what to do. We just need to equip everybody with the skills to do it. They're really the bedrock and that's why I picture communication at the base here. It's the bedrock of delivering this higher quality care. And I was able to see, I've heard a couple of times today Vital Talk mentioned and I've had the privilege and pleasure of partnering with Vital Talk as well to bring workshops to oncology clinicians and not those who are brand new, but those who are mid-career and that are responsible for teaching the others, it's transformational, even in just a day, 
to take it back to talking about and learning the techniques of talking about goals of care. Sometimes they have to unlearn really bad habits that they're passing on otherwise. But it's an incredibly powerful opportunity that we really need to sort of embed into the fabric of education. Just like um, their book says, those conversations that ba balance honesty with empathy and hope, that's what helps cultivate prognosis awareness and understanding. It informs shared decision making that everybody says they want. And it supports delivery of goal-directed care that we're all striving toward. But it also helps patients and families use their time, whatever it is, limited or lengthy, as they want, so that they can spend good time doing what's important to them. So I've been in this game for about 15 years with the American Cancer Society in a number of roles. And one of those is getting to write bills and then lobby them. But in the midst of all of that, um, my brother Eric was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. It had spread to his brain. And his oncology team, here he is with his kids, my niece, nieces and nephew. And his oncology team gave him a prognosis, even though he had already spread to the brain and his lung was collapsed when he presented on diagnosis. With our treatments today, we can probably give you about one to seven years. I don't think there was any study where that had ever been <laughs> supported. Um, I know they meant well, but I had to be the bad guy. And I only knew the bad news because of where I worked, the American Cancer Society. What do normal families do when they're faced with that sort of answer? So of course it was fight, fight, fight. Never though, um, in the seven months between diagnosis and him dying, did anybody on his healthcare team ask what's important to you? He never got to talk about the chocolate ice cream in American football as a formula. Had they asked him, he would have said, this is a little self-serving, but it's true. I would enjoy my sister's blueberry pie, because I'm pretty good at that, but also getting to the beach, which we did, but not with the support of his oncology team. And ideally, I could make it to my daughter Amanda's 21st birthday. So we need to think about the opportunities we have now to focus on patients and families and what they hold dear. Instead, what happened with Eric is that the system continued his radiation and chemotherapy long after he was able still to walk in for his treatments. He had to be wheeled in, yet they still continued to prescribe those disease-directed treatments. They ordered scans to show that the cancer had spread. We knew that just by looking at him, believe me. He had ER visits for poorly controlled pain and then an impacted bowel because somebody forgot to prescribe a bowel regimen as part of those opioids that weren't even working anyway. And he had a distressing death in the hospital with the wrong kid in the room and the kid who would have been a little more supportive back home sleeping because she didn't know it was his last night. And then the aftermath of that for all of us. So that kind of story puts fire in your belly, and I know thousands of them because of where I work and the advocacy agenda and the patients and families and caregivers that I work with. They all ask the same thing, and I asked really, where was the support that should have been readily available right down the hall? Our hometown community cancer center had a palliative care team and inpatient service. The oncologists wouldn't let them touch him. That's several years ago, but I know it still happens. So what did I do? And the only thing I could, I you know, wrote a bill and built a coalition together with my organization. Um, and there's federal and state legislation to help move us along. But here's what I learned about hope and resiliency. It has many constellations, and they change over time. So we built a beautiful ad campaign. If you need to give people the words to use to get the care they need, Nothing serves that value more than a beautiful picture that describes this is sort of the essence of palliative care, treating the person beyond the disease. And the opportunity we have, these were geared for, these are ACS CAN, our advocacy affiliates ads, that are targeting people, but also policymakers to help them understand the importance of this quality of life movement and the agenda. I think they're beautiful. There's a whole series, but they really say quite a bit with very little print. There's a coalition that stretches across diseases, across, dis across disciplines, that's focused on both legislative uh, initiatives and regulatory, federal and state. 
and I'm very excited about the opportunity, so I have more hope than ever, despite the experience my family and Gavin and Wendy had with Evan, to think about what we can do looking ahead with forces joining like this. And it's gonna be all hands on deck because we've heard about the tsunami, the demographics are changing, and we really need to all think about it. So I wanna close with another patient voice story because just a month and a half ago, I lost my mom to ALS. That's a tough one too. And we got off to a really shaky start because, there we are doing the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> We got off to a shaky start because her speech started to slur, no other symptoms. And she has a family history of, you know, congestive heart failure and stuff like that. And she's always been sort of watched for her heart. So we went to her cardiologist. And over time, her symptoms continued with the slurring of the speech and a little lightheadedness. And so at one point, um, when she was on vacation in Maine, she got so dizzy that they brought her to the emergency room because her speech markedly deteriorated and they put in a pacemaker, sort of on an emergency basis and unfortunately in the process of that perforated her pericardium. These things happen. Um, but she came back home and went back to her cardiologist because despite all of that intervention, her speech was still getting worse. And so she said to her cardiologist, Doctor, I'm really worried, and I sort of stoked her up to tell him. I said, Mom, you've got to tell him what's worrying you. I'm really worried because my speech is continuing to get worse. And guess what he said? Mrs. Quarterman, your slurred speech is the last thing you should be worried about. That's really not okay, the irony that a cardiologist has no heart. <laughs> It occurred to me, and I've done enough work in the larger space of serious illness, let's go talk to a neurologist, and so we did. And to fast forward the story, I brought mom to Johns Hopkins, where indeed that slurred speech was the number one clue that led us to the path of the real diagnosis. And so then we fell into the care that involved nothing but palliative care because there's really no treatment other than one FDA-approved drug that maybe staves off um, breathing problems by a few months. That was such a stark contrast for me, the difference between my brother, who had a treatable but certainly not curable condition, and what we threw at him out of habit, and my mother, who had an incurable but highly palliative treatable condition, and the difference in care from the get-go. Um, but also, I knew more. But I wonder, just like some of the others that spoke this morning, what do normal people do? Because I knew everything I needed to know to make sure she got this right level of care, and I can tell you um, from the very beginning, our goals of care for mom were no extensive measures or breathing machines. Her sister, when mom was a freshman in college, was felled by polio, neck down, iron lung. So she knew very much what quality of life was gonna mean for her, and that was enjoying her painting and her grandchildren, and then when it was the other shoe would drop as she described it. She wanted home hospice care and the support of that, and that's exactly what we got. But it took a lot of finessing and a lot of advocacy to make it happen, even though I'm who I am, and we are now you know, in this day and age. So it's important for us to sort of take inspiration from the stories that we all have. So on January 28, my brother and I um, came because the hospice nurse called and said, you need to be here. And so we both drove, and the hospice nurse actually told us everything to expect and what to do. And so my brother's a clinical psychologist, and I'm a lawyer. We had no idea what to do. <laughs> but we had her at home, and everything was comfortable, and it felt very natural, and we did right by her. So it's only been six weeks, but I can talk about it with this warmth Instead of the raw pain, it took me two years to be able to even write a letter to the oncologist when my brother died. I was so angry. The difference between that raw pain and the opportunity we all have to work together to make this quality of life embedded into every healthcare system, every community, and every clinician, I think that's sort of our obligation. I certainly take it on as mine, and I think we all do. I'm just not convinced yet. It took all my skill set to make this happen for mom. I'm not convinced yet it's available for everyone. And I know from last week's pediatric conversation, it's not available for children and families either. So there's plenty of work yet to do. 
So with a little artistic license, I will close with this theme about the quality of living and the importance of that, because I think that's a central mantra of how, mantra of how we change payment, how we change practice, how we change patient and family understanding. If we give them the words to use to get the quality of life care that they need, they will demand it, and nothing will change practice faster than that. So I think it's achievable, and it may be a little too late to change the print on the report, but there's never too late to change our messaging to make sure that it matters, matches up with what matters most. So thank you all very much.